All right. We'll go ahead and get started with the introduction so that I can hand over the full hour to Professor Deng to share her wonderful research with all of us. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. At MIT, we pride ourselves in pushing traditional fields into new frontiers. And this is particularly challenging because not only do you have to be an expert in the new frontier that you're going into, you also have to have a very solid and firm understanding of the field in which the research is positioned is based. The field of combustion in particular has a rich and storied history. And Professor Deng, in her, uh, her graduate career and her postdoctoral career uh, in Princeton and at Stanford was well versed in this traditional foundation. And in her work here at MIT, she's really been pushing the frontier in developing new tools for us to gain insights into combustion and through those insights, harness combustion as a capability that allows us to create new materials and essentially a new process by which to make materials in a more sustainable and energy efficient way. In machine learning, one of the hot topics today, as, as George and others can attest, is this idea of uh, question answer, uh, is trying to figure out, uh, for example, what's going on inside of a neural network. And what's beautiful about the tools that Sili has prepared, will present to you today is that much of the answers are intrinsic. They're uh, embedded in the structure, in the activation function of the neural network itself through these chemical reaction neural networks. And I just wanted to close by, by mentioning one of the amazing things about Sili is how engaged she is. As all of you can attest here in person, um, there is, uh, an incredible value to interpersonal engagement, interaction, uh, guest speaker comes by, you sit down with them, you exchange ideas, and I've witnessed this in action, where Asili has met with, for example, Professor Julia Su, who was visiting from University of Texas at Dallas, sitting down with her and, and discussing research. So I, I would say Asili is probably one of the most engaged colleagues uh, here in the department. I'm just overjoyed um, uh, having you as a colleague. So. With that, I'll, without further ado, we'll uh, let Professor Deng uh, present her research. So thank you so much for today. Thank you, Tonio, for the wonderful introduction. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> all right, so like... Yeah, thank you. So like Tonio mentioned, uh, my background is in combustion. So I'm wondering, what would you guys think of combustion? Uh, the first picture to your mind, what would that be? So I can share my, as my friends know that I do combustion research, so whenever they need to set a fire for barbecue, they think of me. <laughs> yeah, so um, depending on what's the mood you might have, say if you're the sum in the summer, you're enjoying the barbecue in the Bay Area, and you see, okay, the sky isn't that clear, you see the, the influence from the wildfire, you might think of, oh, we need to control combustion, we need to avoid the wildfire, etc. And when you drive in, if you are driving just by yourself, you enjoy the power that your little car provides you. You probably were driving a Mustang and really fast on the highway. Or if you get stuck, you start to feel the emission, the exhaust from the car uh, ahead of you, right? So we associate combustion uh, with many daily life activities and it's definitely not uh, an unfamiliar word to you. So, but when I put combustion and sustainability together, uh, some of my colleagues mentioned to me, that's, a, that's an interesting combination. And what would you feel about it? So before I put together the slides, I actually asked about uh, ChatGPT about this. What would be the sentiment uh, in the room? What should I expect from my audience? So essentially, I, I, it's a screenshot, so I actually uh, narrowed down the top three answers. So essentially, it says that, well, people might have mixed of feeling, it depends on which area they are in. They may have different opinions, but probably the most prevalent perception I might get could be a negative one. That the people would associate combustion, especially the combustion of fossil fuels, to the emissions, and well, it's, it's the opposite side of sustainability. Well, I won't argue too much about that. I think it's also backed by the facts that here I'm showing you the data compiled by a US Environmental Protection Agency, and you will see that in the year 2021, for the US, here are the greenhouse gas emissions by the, the type of gases, and uh, the blue 
part actually capture our attention is that about 73% uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from the combustion of fossil fuels. All right, so the key, key question, key uh, keywords are two things. Combustion is a process and the fuel is a fossil fuel. But there are also other opinions and I'm going to show you the evidence that support those opinions. The second one is called economic necessity, meaning that we, our society is still powered a lot by the combustion process, especially by the combustion of fossil fuels. I'm going to show you uh, why this is the case, why this is a difficult uh, problem to handle. And second one is that as we transition to a cleaner fuel, we do have some distance to go and, and uh, we need to come up with cleaner alternatives or uh, build up systems for uh, sustainability. So here is the energy demand. So essentially the US energy consumption in the past year. And here are a breakdown of several uh, components. But a few uh, takeaway would be, let's first take a look at the general uh, landscape for energy consumption. So we are roughly at 100 uh, quadrillion British uh, BTUs per year at, uh, in the US. And that trend has been like that for the past 30 years or so, we do have some up and downs, probably driven by the growth in population and the down probably due to the COVID. That's the period we're all very familiar with. But generally speaking, we are talking about the energy provided by the facts uh, sectors and the, the bandwidth of different bands uh, showing the relative uh, significance for those five categories. And by looking at the bottom three, we see that roughly about 80% of the energy mix still come from the fossil fuel. And whatever change that we've been making, we're thinking the most significant one is actually the shift from coal to natural gas, uh, a shift from different uh, mixtures, uh, from the more uh, carbon intensive coal to a less carbon intensive natural gas. And the development for renewables are roughly stagnant for the past 30 years or so. And the second fact is that if we break down the renewables, uh, actually we have a mixture as well. We do have about 37% reliance on the uh, biomass. So they are considered to be cleaner fuels. And uh, our renewables are consist, other renewables could be the wind, hydroelectric, solar, and geothermal and they contribute to the, to the rest. So if we categorize information by the energy consumption uh, via combustion process, we're actually talking about roughly 85%. Meaning the take home message for our combustion scientists would be, okay, based on that 85%, how can we do to make the process more efficient such that we can cut down the need in energy consumption and such that we can contribute to a lower carbon emission. And the second one is that we do see a long way to go to ramp up the activity in terms of harvesting renewables. So we need to build such infrastructures, scale them up to be able to uh, replace the current energy structure. So essentially we need to have a multi-tier solutions for a sustainable future. In the near term, in short term, we need to think about combustion and how to make that process as reliable as possible and as clean as possible. And then we need to uh, still leverage this process but come up with alternative fuels. And finally, if we are going to scale up the harvest and the storage of renewable energies, then we need to think about how we can scale up this in a, a environmental friendly and sustainable sustainable way. So that's what my group is doing here at MIT. We are bringing these multi-tier solutions by leveraging our understanding in fundamental combustion and tailoring these understandings into developing technologies. For example, we develop a scientific machine learning uh, technologies to help us understand the fundamental physics to help us accelerate the prediction of combustion systems to understand the chemical models and fluid models goes into it and predict the system level responses. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this topic as well as how we take that fundamental knowledge we get 
to develop technologies that can help us make the materials, the building blocks uh, for energy conversion and storage. While I don't have time to really dive into all three areas, we do have some exciting work on identifying and discover new fuels uh, to replace fossil fuels. So let's get started with the technology first. As I mentioned before, um, we, are trying to, uh, we are trying to transition to a more sustainable future and energy uh, generation with the renewable fuels as well as uh, the storage that takes care of the intermittency in a lot of reno renewable sources would be essential. And driven by the need in uh, the electrification in the transportation sector as well as grid uh, electricity storage, the demand for lithium batteries have increased over the years and it's also projected to be significantly increased for the next uh, decades or so. And in terms of battery, uh, there are a lot of talks that is going on in the department as well as uh, neighbor department is that essentially we want to achieve a good balance between the performance and the cost. So essentially we are having a trade off between the scale of the system, the performance and the, uh, the cost associated with all the materials. For example, we want to uh, achieve a good performance by co-optimizing multiple components. And the most important component in the, in the equation, of course, everything needs to go together, but it also uh, a, a large significant uh, portion of research has been dedicated to the research of cathode materials, which is a multi-component metal oxide that contains certain uh, transition metals, lithium, as well as uh, other uh, dopants to, to uh, make a high performance materials. And in terms of the cost, it's really uh, can be br break down into the pie chart and then we could see that in terms of the, the cost, the castle also contribute a significant portion in the uh, battery cost. And without showing there, actually the manufacturing cost for the material, for cathode material, it's also contributing to half of the cost for the cathode materials. So now, then our goal is to see whether we can generate these multi-component metal oxide using the combustion method to uh, have a scale up in the production and have a lower cost in the production. And that is the work I'm going to show you today. So before I dive into the technology that our group is uh, particularly uh, invest in, I want to show you the uh, current state of the art manufacturing method for lithium battery cathode materials. And that is called the co-precipitation method. And based on its name, actually you could see there is a co-precipitation process and another process called the lithiation. So in short, is that for the uh, multi-component metal oxide, uh, except uh, lithium, actually all the precursors would come into the play in solutions. And in this process, by adjusting the pH, we can get the co-precipitation of the precursors. And that's called the precursor production. And via some separation from the liquid phase and the particles, we can get some precursors out. And in the next step, we, we call this a lithiation, meaning that lithium source in the form of oxide and salt will come into play and we will have a solid state mixing uh, between the lithium source and um, the precursor. And this process due to its solid state mixing nature is expected to take a long time so that we do have a high temperature, high time, a long time uh, annealing process in place. So a quick recap of this process would be in the previous, in this first stage of precursor manufacturing, we leverage in the liquid phase the good atomic level mixing. And we can control the size relatively well, but the whole uh, process is a batch, normally it's a batch based process. It takes time to, to react and the reaction rate in the solutions aren't great. So it takes about 10 hours for this process to happen. And in the second step, because of the solid state mixing, we actually uh, are experiencing a high energy uh, demand in uh, consumption in this process and also very time consuming. So both uh, stage would have a place to improve to help us scale up the production significantly. 
So in terms of building affordable uh, infrastructure for energy storage, then we definitely want to bring down the cost. So here are how we analyzed the problem. We thought that the, the cost can be reduced in these three aspects. We can try to simplify the system. As I showed you, the co-precipitation method has a very long flow chart with many key, uh, capital components there. And uh, we can shrink down the manufacturing time in the process to reduce the labor cost as well as the energy cost. And a lot of uh, lab scale experiments have been proposed to look into different manufacturing method. And our method is inspired by the combustion process. So you all have these romantic scenarios where you lit a candle and uh, if you well, forget your partner and just stare at the candle, you might see some black smoke there. Okay, that's not very romantic to do. Um, so, but what the process is, and this is actually taken from my uh, PhD thesis, is that we do have the precursors uh, come into play as the hydrocarbons, and when the incomplete combustion happens, we do uh, have some gaseous species called the PAH molecules. And as they grow inside the flame without being fully oxidized, we actually would form particles from this process. And whatever cannot be fully consumed in the flame will go out, so you would see the black smoke. Those are uh, composed of this uh, uh, particulate matter. So if we are summarizing this process into simple flowchart, it would be we need to supply to the flame. The flame works as a reactor, and we supply the flame with certain precursors, and we can get solid particles via this uh, high temperature process. And that is exactly the what the technology we have in mind. And that is also the technology that is being used to produce a massive amount of carbon black and some other commodity materials, such as uh, titanium dioxide, et cetera, is by uh, carefully selecting the precursors, controlling the flame as a reactor, and uh, obtain the solid particles, metal oxides, or carbon materials of desired morphology and performance. So in my lab, uh, my group member, John An, is sitting down there, actually wearing the same shirt, so he's easy to recognize. It's developing this so-called flame-assisted spray pyrolysis process. And to, uh, to show you uh, how we can utilize this method to synthesize uh, battery materials. So here, uh, remember the equation that I just present to you, precursor, flame as a reactor, and get particles. So this uh, flowchart is just as simple as that. So we would have precursors coming into play in terms of solutions. We dissolve everything. So here is a difference compared to the co-precipitation. It's including lithium. We dissolve every precursors into water and spray that into the system in the form of fine droplets. And during the process, that's where the reactor comes into play. Instead of having a single flame reactor, we do tailor the entire thermal process by having a few sections for the preheating zone and the, the, the burner to have a fast heating. So I will show you later on how controlling these temperature process, uh, thermal processes are very important. And finally, after the flame zone, we can collect particles and we can characterize the material performance, et cetera. Because this process is very fast, it's within seconds, so it, it can be a high throughput uh, process. And after we gather the materials, we can perform the same calcination process as previously highlighted in the co-precipitation method. So we select the model material as the NCM811, so it's a multi-component a uh, material containing not only lithium, but also nickel, cobalt, and the manganese that is, uh, that is uh, regarded as a uh, uh, next generation uh, lithium ion batteries due to its high nickel content and high uh, capacity. So this is the, the, the flow chart that we envision if we were able to scale up the lab scale a fast process flame spray uh, assisted spray pyrolysis into an industrial scale, it, you can directly see that compared to the co-precipitation, we do see a significantly smaller size and simpler uh, geometry and uh, orientation, et cetera. And we can harvest 
this uh, continuous production as well as the atomic level mixing in the solution and the high throughput manufacturing get the materials. And by uh, connecting things here rather than putting uh, the lithiation into a separate step, we can already reduce the synthesis time by, by 50%. But we ask ourselves this question. So if we have already changed how we come up with the precursor, do we need to have exactly the same calcination step as the co-precipitation method? Can we do more there to further reduce the cost and energy consumption in the synthesis process? So we did a thought process and tried to understand why this is the case. Essentially, finally, we nailed down into these two uh, corners and categories. So the current step is this. We try to have a relatively lower temperature and relatively longer uh, time for the calcination because we need to allow the diffusions to happen. So this is, we need to supply enough high temperature for this process to happen and long time to have a controllable process for the diffusion and have a uniform distribution of the multi-component uh, inside the particle. Whereas what we really want to do is to go to this corner. We want to do things really, really fast so that we can significantly shrink the calcination time to save energy and time in the production. So we, th we thought why we couldn't do this in the, via the traditional method. And so we created this baseline. So we used our method and, uh, to generate NCM811 particles. And we said we need to, we found that we need to calcinate it at uh, 750 Celsius for 13 hours. And if we do it at a shorter time, we couldn't achieve it. This is because we do see some small nanoparticles later on identified as some lithium salt uh, at, formed at the surface of the particle. So if that is the case, then essentially we need to have a relatively high temperature and long calcination time to have that lithium source diffuse into the particles. And that is the reason why we need to have a long calcination time. So after identifying this issue, so it's the same issue, it just at a different uh, TEM uh, and SEM to, to further summarize the problem. And this is the magic we did, that you could clearly see the difference that we don't have these uh, nanoparticles anymore uh, and we have a pretty nice distribution of the particles. And here is the story I want to unopen this box and, and share with you, is that by adding 2.5% 2 of urea into the precursor, we magically remove the, the, uh, the nanoparticles appeared at the surface uh, and they can already have a uniform distribution inside the particle. And I'm going to explain to you why and how we can do this. So, but before we dive into that, I want to show you, and this is actually related to the performance, and not only we want to have a good looking particle, but also we want to have a good performance, and why we can afford to have a relatively higher temperature but shorter calcination time, is that we look into this uh, thermal behavior as we heat up the particle. And long story short, essentially, that add, after adding urea, our material will have a less shift in the peak as we, we, we increase its temperature, meaning that this new material has a better thermal stability. And why having a higher thermal stability is good is that now, in the previous one, we have to, because it's super sensitive to the temperature, and if we increase the temperature too high, we will not have good performance. And that's why we need to calcinate the material at a relatively lower temperature of 750 and for 13 hours long. However, by adding urea, actually this material can sustain higher temperature. So by increasing the temperature, we can significantly shorten the calcination time, and that is the goal. So previously, like I mentioned, we need to follow the recipe for cold precipitation. That's the 750 uh, for 13 hours, but that's not the entire story. Actually, in order to uh, not crack the particle and also make the uniform distribution inside the particle, we actually need to have a relatively long time of ramping up the temperature. And the total process is actually taking a day long. 
but with our method and utilizing the, the FASP method as well as by adding 2% of uh, urea, we can ignore, we can eliminate all these process and by just putting the particles into the oven for 20 minutes, we can get uh, the end material. So ultimately we are achieving uh, 30 times uh, faster synthesis and you can imagine how much uh, cost and uh, energy consumption is gonna save. And here is, is the comparison between the two. What this figure is showing you without diving into the details is that we can achieve essentially the same performance in terms of the capacity of the battery as well as the retention after the cycling. So both the stability of the material and the capacity of the material can maintain the same level. Um, if by adding a little bit of urea in the precursors and we can significantly reduce the calcination time and energy consumption. And compare it with the literature using other materials, we, we still see very, very uh, compelling performance. So why we can achieve such a good performance and have a, such a significant uh, reduction in the, in the production time and uh, energy consumption that we want to dive into the fundamental science and particularly look at the two things is why by adding urea we can reduce the time and how we can control the, uh, the morphology of the materials and achieve the desired morphology and the performance. So now I'm going to introduce uh, Manus' work on this. Uh, the work is still uh, under review, but we are very excited to, to open the box and, and share with you why uh, we adding urea is helpful. So in order to do that, we took the sample from the experiments and crashed the particles so we can have a high resolution looking at what the particle look like. And uh, from this figure, you and we can do the element mapping and show how the element distribute inside these particles. And uh, on this one, you, different color columns show you a si simple uh, component in, in element distribution uh, along the radial direction. And on the top, we see the uh, NCM particles, and on the bottom, we see the urea with the urea additives. So the Summary of the perform summary of the result would be for the pure NCM particles, we do see some enrichment of the nickel component on the surface. So we do see a gradient structure from the surface to the center. And uh, because mass has to be conserved, so we do see some less component of the manganese compared to, to the center. Uh, so is the lithium. We do see a gradient structure in the lithium distribution. Whereas, generally speaking, in the NCM with urea additives, uh, the distribution is more homogeneous. So we want to understand why adding urea help us distribute uh, lithium and help us distribute other elements such that we can get the same uh, performance with much, much shorter calcination time. And in order to understand that, we go back, stay away from the, the lab scale big experiments and try to look at what happens to a single droplet inside the chamber. Remember, I said in the precursor stage, we spray the droplet into a, a chamber and control its uh, heating process. So we mimic this heating process by using this, uh, this chamber. Inside this hot chamber, we can control the, the environment and we have a holder where we put uh, I'm not sure if you can see it in the back, we put a silicon carbide fibers, very, very thin, and suspend our uh, droplet precursors onto it. Okay, and then after we lower the holder into the heating environment, we can do high-speed camera imaging and try to look at what happens uh, as the droplet evaporate. And here is what it looks like. So please take a look at the upper right figure. So it's very fast, and we do see that the particle shrinks, and uh, by the careful design, the, uh, the, the droplet uh, re remain as a spherical shape, make it easier for us to do the further modeling by using this one-dimensional assumption because it's uh, symmetric. And uh, there is nothing really uh, standing out, it's just uh, the 
diameter shrinks. And uh, finally, it stopped there because this is not a pure droplet, but with some solvent there, right? So the particle uh, gets formed, and we would have a solid shell, preventing the diameter to be further uh, reduced. And please take a close look at the video uh, below. It's going to look different. All right, so at the very beginning, as we heat up the droplet, it, we do see that it shrinks pretty much similar in a similar manner compared to the pure uh, NCM droplet. However, beyond certain point after it becomes small, it's expanded. And we do, if you sit in the front, you might see that you do see some bubbles formed and uh, making, uh, you have uh, some gases released, so making the particles um, enlarged. And how does this qualitatively and quantitatively compare? Is that we take, we took those videos and just do the screenshot so we can track how the diameter changes with time and compare it with uh, simulation. So essentially we said that we control the part, droplet to be as spherical as possible so we can see, we can make a one dimensional uh, assumption and then compare it with a single droplet evaporation model. So for a single droplet evaporation under heating the heated condition, we expect to see a so-called D square law because it's a surface evaporation. The diameter versus time should change in a relatively a linear manner. And that's what we see for both scenarios that we have, a, a, we have NCM and we have NCM urea. So both of them, and this temperature is selected to be 110 which is slightly higher than the boiling point of water, which is a solvent in this case. But urea would stay in the solution without uh, being decomposed. So we roughly have that. And the diameter would change. We will be a constant, roughly constant, after uh, the solvent goes away. However, by increasing the temperature to 170 Celsius, where we trigger the thermal decomposition of urea becoming gases, we do see that with uh, the neat uh, droplet, we do still see the two uh, D square law, meaning that it's just happening in a faster manner, right? But for the urea, we start to see the expansion, et cetera. And the closer look at the figure, we see that it's the formation of some bubbles. And uh, this, uh, the details cannot directly got from the uh, experiments, so we leverage the computational study to look at what happens. So essentially, without going to the nitty gritty, uh, as the temperature, uh, as we heat up the particle, the uh, vapor, uh, the, the solvent would evaporate, and the concentration of all the solvent would increase. And depending on the relative uh, solubility as well as its uh, concentration, we start to see that uh, some elements would precipitate from the solution. And the final one would correspond to uh, the, the actual uh, ratio that we put into the precursor. However, for the neat uh, NCM particle, we do see that uh, a profile in the element distribution, right? So it's not a uniform distribution. That explains why we need a relatively long time for the uh, calcination step to, to smooth out the distribution. Whereas by adding urea, although we still see a distribution, that is due to the fact that we, we do have different ratios for the elements, the profile in the radial direction seems to have a more uniform distribution. And that is what urea is doing to, to the system. So to summarize the, uh, the mechanism using this uh, schematic, is that by comparing these two, is that the urea would decompose, and when it decomposes, you also see it from the video, that it will generate bubbles and enhance the internal mixing inside the droplet, such that we enhance the effective diffusivity inside the particles. We can have a more uniform distribution in the, the end materials. And that's the key reason why we can achieve a much better mixing in the elements and then achieve the same level of performance in the batteries. 
And very briefly, I will also introduce you our work on how we can control the morphology. I just mentioned to you how we can control the element distribution to achieve good performance. But performance not only depends on the composition, but also depends on the morphology. And that's another work that Janan did uh, in the past a couple of years, uh, is that we can actually control the temperature history by carefully selecting the temperature profile inside the preheating chamber and the flame zone such that we can control the morphology. Uh, we want to avoid the scenarios like these, the broken particles, which does not have very good mechanical strength and in terms of performance, they are not going to be good. But we want to relatively maintain these, but also have some uh, flexibility for further design is that by com combining the flame section and preheating section, we can get either dense particle, very solid ones, dense ones, versus these uh, hollow ones. You see that in, in, in the center is a little bit uh, lighter in color. So we, we actually have a shell of the uh, material rather than the fully dense material. That also give us some uh, space if we want to further do the morphology engineering uh, to achieve certain performance or to accommodate uh, the special need when we assemble things together. And, but nonetheless, we do have a good temperature window that we can achieve relatively, so, so here, that we can achieve relatively good retention ratio as well as the, the capacity. So for the past uh, 25 minutes or so, I introduce you the, the FAST method that is our de uh, developed by our uh, group that uh, we want to uh, come in, we want to uh, really leverage our understanding of fundamental uh, combustion and the uh, evaporation of particles similar to the spray drying or spray pro uh, process in, in engines and try to turn that into a manufacturing method. And we uh, have some flexibility in terms of the composition control as well as the morphology control. And some ongoing work is that how can we maintain such physics to stay the same if we build, build up the surface, uh, build up the, the system and uh, scale up the productions? And uh, how do we integrate different things together and bring it to industrial scale? While uh, the performance is definitely a very important uh, par uh, parameter to consider for energy storage using batteries, the safety of the batteries is also of great concern. You might relate this to your personal experience when you check your luggage or you do a gate check, what the attendants would ask you. Do you have any lithium battery in your bag, right? So actually, the, the battery fire is actually a very uh, important issue that uh, we care about, uh, especially as we ramp up the usage of lithium batteries in uh, electric vehicles. And the battery fire, if we use the scientific term, is actually called the thermal runaway. So meaning that the thermal uh, profile cannot be controlled inside the battery. And it can be triggered by many aspects. It can be like you, uh, you um, fracture the uh, battery so the electrolyte is in contact with air. It could be internal short circuit, but essentially is that it would, this, these processes would generate heat and such that your material start to decompose and which further release heat such that you enter this uh, death cycle that you see a thermal runaway. But we want to understand how the thermal stability of the materials contribute to uh, the thermal runaway and how we can model such a process uh, of uh, predicting, to predict the thermal runaway of materials. And typically this is how people would model, would uh, gather the experimental data to model thermal runaway. And this is called differential scanning calorimetry. So essentially, we would take away, take apart the uh, battery and separate the materials and put them in these crucibles and run experiments like this. By controlling the temperature uh, history by having a constant <coughs> heating rate, we can track the heat flux inside the system, compare the, the sample that we want to test with a reference. And the uh, 
data would look something like this. This uh, x-axis is that as the heating goes up, the system level increases, and uh, we can track the heat flow comparing the sample and the reference. And whatever peaks with the, the bottom shape would be uh, endothermic, meaning that it's absorbing heat. And for a tip up uh, surface, it would be, uh, we have an exothermic reaction, meaning that we are releasing heat. So thermal runaway would be associated with those exothermic reactions that it generates heat and further uh, trigger other reactions that would generate more heat. And the typical way of analyzing such uh, data would be uh, the Kissinger analysis. There are a few assumptions associated with it. Uh, you don't need to remember all of them. I just want to highlight a few. For example, you need to assume what type of reaction this is. So particularly, you need to assume this is a, a one-step global reaction. You need to also assume first-order reaction such that you can manipulate uh, the data gathered at a different uh, temperatures uh, and different heating rates. So this is taken from the literature, and we also use this for our modeling approach. But I want to first uh, walk you through uh, this figure, is that this is obtained in the DSC experiments I just showed you. Uh, what this is, the different colors correspond to different heating rates. And the reason why we need to have different heating rates is to perform the uh, Kissinger analysis. So by plotting, so first we need to identify one, two, three. There are three peaks, uh, and we need to assume that each peak would correspond to a single reaction, and they are independent from each other, such that we can use a Kissinger analysis. And the, the peak location, we can take that and compare how the peak location shift as we uh, change the heating rate, we can come up with a figure in the metal. And then take the slope of that figure and will give us activation energy. And this works pretty well. Well, at least it looks like it's working pretty well for a system like this where we have three uh, distinct peaks. However, what if you see a figure looking like this? This is another NCM material with slightly different uh, the composition and the crystal structure, you actually only see two peaks, the dashed lines here. But you know, it's, a, it's the same material, so it should have three reactions that uh, is giving a VOA heat. Then how do we uh, uh, assign peaks? So actually, when you do DSC analysis, the software can do it for you if you say, yes, there are three peaks, please fit it to three peaks. And here's a fitting result. You do have the three distinct peaks, but something does not look really right. You can still fit the profile very well. However, your second peak, which is supposed to be a reaction that happens after your first reaction happens, now happens before the first reaction. So physically, it's not really making sense, but uh, data-wise, it's, it's, it's a good fit, right? So that brings us to this uh, debate, is that when we do modeling, especially nowadays, we're doing a lot of data-driven modeling, how much should we trust the data, how, the, how, how good the fitness is, and how much we want to leverage the physical understanding? And uh, how do we understand this uh, thermal runaway problem for batteries? What type of tools do we need to develop to understand such complex uh, thermal uh, problems and chemical problems uh, that really motivate our development in the so-called scientific machine learning activities in the group? So essentially, we, we, we acknowledge that for any physics-based physics -based modeling, it's really good at explaining what happens, right? So if we have an equation, we can assign different terms to different meanings, we, we understand the physics. So not only we explain what happens, it fits well to the observations, but also we make sense why, uh, what material is being decomposed, or what material is being formed. So that's, that's really good. And we have a certain experiments done for certain uh, conditions. We pretty much, some, for other conditions, we might experience the same physics. So physics-based modeling can really help us extend the knowledge to other unseen scenarios, given that the physics still holds. Whereas for the general data-driven modeling, especially nowadays, people are using 
um, machine learning techniques to fit the data just to do the black box fitting, then we could achieve the same level or even better level of fitting performance. However, we couldn't really explain what happens. We model things as a black box. And we are pretty confident that when it is an interpolation problem, meaning that the scenario we want to predict or correlate appears within the region where we have data to train the model, then we, we are pretty confident that this black box modeling is, can do a pretty good job. However, what happens if we want to do a global optimization? What happens if we want to predict scenarios where we have not seen before? Do we have such confidence that we can extrapolate? And that's actually very difficult. And generally, it's believed that machine learning couldn't do extrapolation really well. So we want to have a balance between the two. We want to have the best from both worlds. Can we come up with physically meaningful machine learning algorithms that we can also leverage the uh, good uh, data uh, fitting capabilities? And that motivates our uh, discussion on the chemical reaction neural network framework that we later on would demonstrate its usage in modeling battery thermal runaway and battery fires. So the rationale I already explained to you, we want to utilize fundamental science to constrain the machine learning algorithm. As Tonio uh, previously uh, mentioned, is that we particularly incorporate the physical laws into the architecture of the neural networks. And particularly, we are interested in thermal reaction, uh, chemical reactions, A and B goes to C and D, and what are the fundamental laws that we think are generally ac applicable to uh, chemical reaction systems. And we, we found that the law of mass action telling us how does the reaction rate correlate to the species concentration is one of the uh, uh, fundamental law that we need to comply to. And the other one is particularly to temperature sensitive reactions. Then the Arrhenius law telling us how the reaction rate constant depend on temperature. That is another fundamental law that we want to comply to. So we, with these two laws in mind, we develop the structure of the neural network and use that as a fitting tool to compare it with the, with the experiments. So let me uh, spend one minute or so to generally explain to you what does this framework do. So let's take this reaction, uh, methane oxidized into uh, CO2 and water as an example. So we said that we need to comply with mass of a, uh, law of mass action, and we want to uh, inform the structure of the neural network with that. So we draw a simple neural network. So in the left, that's the input layer. And in the middle is a hidden layer where we have a nonlinear activation function, and the output layer is the species production rate that we want to predict. So if we mathematically, if we look at how physically we can put together reaction rate is like this. But taking some mathematical transformation, we can put a linear in a combination here in the exponent, whereas we choose the activation function to be the exponential function, such that we can express this physical, physically meaningful chemical reaction into a connection of different neurons. So in the language of neural network, we would give them names as the weights, bias, activation function, and weights, etc. But in the physical world, they also have their counterparts, such as the reaction order of this reaction, the rate of constant of that reaction, as well as how things are related to each other in the uh, function that is called the stoichiometric coefficients. So every single parameter in the neural network now has their physical meaning. In other words, we have a physically interpretable neural network that whatever gets fit with this model also can have their actual physical parameters identified. Similarly, we do this by embedding the Arrhenius law. So essentially, we just need to open up this node on the rate constant and express this further into another linear combination uh, of things. 
finally, I just mentioned to you, for a single reaction, we can express it as a single uh, neuron in the hidden uh, layer. But if we want to model a system of reactions, a network of reactions, we simply just need to stack them together. So by increasing the number of neurons in the uh, hidden layer, we can achieve this structure. So the, in the input, we take the species and the temperature information. Uh, in the output layer, we can predict how the reactants and uh, species would change over time. So the number of uh, input layer node would denote temperature and species. And the number of hidden nodes denotes the number of reactions in the system. And the entire thing is physically interpretable. I'm going to show you a case that is most relevant to the battery work that I'm going to spend some time on by showing you this uh, biofuel uh, pyrolysis process. The actual um, example doesn't matter that much, but it has this uh, capability, uh, it has this uh, feature of having both reactions and the thermal uh, temperature dependent rate constant. And here is what the neural network, after training it with data, here is what the neural network sees. It's, uh, first of all, it's a very sparse matrix, which, is com which makes sense if we compare it with uh, uh, chemical reaction schemes. It means that in chemical world, you just do not have all the reactants all come together and react. It is supposed to be a sparse system. And all the uh, parameters in this matrix tells us the stoichiometric coefficients. And as you can see numerically, it also learns all the physical parameters very accurately. So it shows that this method can really fit the data really well, but it's not very surprising. What starts to surprise us is, is this capability, is that when we study science, right, we want to understand what we we want to see that what we understand can be predicted really well. We also want to understand things that we didn't know previously. So this slide shows you the capability of using this framework to know things that we do not know. So I, I'm showing you the logic. I'm probably a little bit twisted here. So there are three cases I'm showing. The baseline case is uh, the black, uh, oh sorry, it's the uh, baseline case is uh, uh, orange line case is what I just showed you on the previous slide is that we tell the system, look, we have six different species measurements and uh, I know there are six species. They are related somehow. Please learn the mechanism for me. And you can see that it can learn the dynamics really, really well. For the second scenario, we told the system, I know there should be six species, however, I can only make measurements for five of them. And surprisingly, it can also, it can, that's the green one. Not only we learn the five species that we give its information, but also it managed to learn the six species that we do not have information on. So it tells us if we know there's something that is missing, this framework can help us still learn the dynamics. Whereas in the third case, we do not tell the system that there are six species in total. We just told it, we just tell it, well, there are five species and here are the five profiles. And in this particular case, we couldn't really capture the dynamics really well, which is the purple line. So what this implies is that we can really treat the number of species and reactions as hyperparameters. So it can just learn it by itself. We do not need to really tell it how many we have. It's that whatever gives us the best performance is the most reliable model that can tell us, okay, there are how many species and how many reactions involved. And with the confidence in the framework, we start to put things uh, into the real data. And this case is very similar to the battery case I'm going to show you next, is that we are in, we are implementing this uh, framework onto condensed uh, phase pyrolysis, meaning that we have some biomass and we put it into a system similar to DSC, but not quite, it's called the TGA, meaning that instead of tracking the thermal heat flux, it can only track the weight of the system and we heat it up. 
So instead of having how species changes, we only have a lump, high level information on the lumped uh, weight of the system. We can only track, okay, you, you lose weight probably because there are some gases leaving the system. It's very convoluted information. However, we can learn the dynamics relatively well, and we can predict the unseen uh, scenarios also very well. And when we talk about machine learning, we always think about, okay, it's, it's a data heavy, data hungry. However, for this particular case, when we gather the literature together, uh, we only found uh, 14 uh, experiments from the, from the same group. So with the 14, we took 10 of them for the training and four of them for the validation. And you could see it's actually performing very, very well. And the reason is this, because first we embed the physics into it such that it captures the dynamics, it captures this derivative field. And second is that even though you only did one experiment, because you have, you are actually seeing the entire time uh, domain, you're seeing the entire evolution, actually the data points in each measurement is, is not a small number. So we can really leverage the entire uh, data space that we can have access to. And without going into the details, here is a high level summary of what the system can identify. So essentially it identified, I need to at least have two more intermediate species, although I do not know what they are, I know there have to be two intermediate species in place. And then they are connected via six uh, reactions. So the machine will read this matrix, but we can also interpret it into the human readable format by, by writing down the pathways and the kinetic parameters. And we can also visualize how things are connected and not only predict of the species that we can measure, but also predict the intermediate species that we cannot measure at the moment. So if later on we have new data, we can compare it uh, with them. So based on that framework, I know I took a detour. I'm going to introduce Ben's work on how to utilize that uh, CRNN framework and in, in especially incorporate some domain knowledge that we already know based on this particular system and try to learn the kinetics associated with battery thermal runaway. So the domain knowledge we know from material scientists is that for the NCM materials to decompose, it have three stages and they are in serial. So that's the new information in addition to the assumptions we made for the CRNN. So particularly uh, in this uh, framework, uh, I'm picking this reaction too as an example is that for reaction two to, to happen, we need to have uh, reaction, we need to have species number two. And that's the product from the previous step of decomposition. And the end result would be consuming uh, species number two and uh, forming species number three. So they, the reactions are in serial and we, need, we can implement that information into the structure of this neural network. And what Ben also did is that instead of tracking the species uh, profile, we can also add a thermodynamic information into it and tracking how heat is generated or, or uh, absorbed during the process. So we can turn this chemical reaction neural network into something that can track the thermal information, similar uh, to the previous example on tracking the weight change. This is tracking the uh, heat flux. So comparing this with the existing method that identify by assuming three individual uh, unlinked reactions with our method, we, we are more truthful to the, to the uh, experiment. So the, 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 the color coded area are the predictions, not prediction, are the measurements by thermal XRD, seeing how different materials decompose and change into other phases. Whereas uh, the, the lines are the predictions from our model and the previous model in the literature assuming different reactions. And you could see that our model captures the dynamics really, really well. And also physically it makes sense. And with this framework, then we can look at different materials. We can uh, compare it with the knowledge that we generally get from experiments that we see if we increase the content of nickel in the material, 
it's going to give us a higher capacity. However, thermal stability wise, it's going to have a lower thermal stability. And having single crystal material is helpful in terms of stabilize the thermal behaviors. And with this part, I, I will give you a short summary is that we develop uh, a machine learning, scientific machine learning tools that aimed at embedding physical laws into the structures of the neural networks such that we can simultaneously identify the reaction pathways as well as the kinetic parameters and to have a physically meaningful neural network that we can extend to other scenarios. And for battery safety modeling, for example, we can apply this to different components of the battery materials and then put together to understand how battery safety can be enhanced. And in today's uh, presentation, I mainly highlighted our work on the manufacturing, combustion for manufacturing, as well as how we come up with scientific machine learning method for um, combustion understanding. And I couldn't achieve this myself. It's really done by my wonderful uh, group members. So I also want to take this opportunity to give a shout out to the group that we are doing other really exciting work. In addition to the battery uh, cathode material work that I just showed you, we're also extending this method to other energy storage materials, such as a solid state electrolyte and other sensing and a catal catalysis materials. And also we are looking into how to scale them up to have industrial applications. And on the scientific machine learning part, we work on identifying uh, data and pattern and uh, model discovery, as well as accelerating the computations, uncertainty quantifications of the machine learning learned models and other physical models, and try to tailor them to, to uh, really advance our technology development. And I didn't have time to talk about today, but hope that I have other opportunities to talk to you some other work on the development of alternative fuels that can help us collectively build a sustainable future. And all these wonderful work will not be uh, achieved without the, the generous support from the funding agencies and industrial partners. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and welcome any questions you might have. several questions. I'll handle the first part of the Q&A, and I'll hand it off to Ahmed to handle the second part. Yes, Matthias. So you can show that the theory that it would change uh, how the lithium and the different components are distributed in particles. We had a very specific concentration, I think 2.5% and 6.5%. Why is that the magical number? Is that a magical number, or can it be a large range of urea concentrations or is very sensitive to this, this condition? Yeah, the question is about why we chose 2.5 as that. So first of all, we didn't do a very large range because we want to make it just as an additive, right? In industrial application, if you can already achieve good performance, you don't want to add something more. But generally, what we need to do is to have uh, some bubbling such that we can have this good mixing. And I would assume that if we add too much, this process would be too fierce that we would have an explosion. In that case, we wouldn't be able to have a big particle in the end, or it would be too, way too porous that we couldn't uh, really have a high energy density in terms of the battery material in the end. That's an optimization it could be, yeah. Thank you. Essentially, that's a problem, uh, you know, really uh, breaks your stuff. I have a slightly detailed question on the uh, neural network architecture. So your activation function is basically exponential, right? Yes. And uh, suppose you do some kind of uh, gradient uh, optimization. So your uh, activation function's gradient, obviously, since exponential grows with the value of the, of the argument, is that a problem, like creating some sort of an isotropy in the convergence rates between uh, concentrations, or as opposed to the LLU, for example? The LLU is like nice and straight and you know, gives a constant gradient. 
exponential. That's not the case. Yeah, that's a great. Yeah, I understand that. That's a great question. So the the choice of the um, exponential activation energy uh, activation function is because in the activation energy is the exponential. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. In order in order to comply to the physics, we have to choose that. But uh, George is perfectly right that it, it gave us some uh, issues in the convergence and training the model. So we need to, in, in actually doing the work, the students are really creative in terms of um, try to smooth out the gradient. There are several tricks that can go with it to make it easier to train. You could approximate it with a, with a sequence of reviews, right? When you would use perhaps a little bit of inter interpretability in favor of numerical stability, have you played this kind of game? That's a really good suggestion. We have not played because they were successful in training the system, but we, we are pretty sure as we scale up it in a, into a more complex system, we could run into such issue. Then your suggestion might be helpful in those scenarios. Thank you. <laughs> a stiff question for a stiff system. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'll, I'll ask one following on Matthias' uh, question about the concentration. Why urea? Are there any other molecules out there that would do better? And what's special about it? Yeah. So for urea, the, the, there is a scientific understanding of that, and also there is a practical understanding of that. So in short, urea has been utilized in some other manufacturing systems. So when we look into the literature, we thought, oh, that might be helpful. And also, urea would fully decompose. It will not leave any mark in the system. So that's good. We ultimately, we not only want to have a, a good morphology, ultimately, it's a performance. So whatever trace element that leaves there that is going detriment, to be detrimental to the battery, we don't want to have them. So we want to have something that can fully decompose and especially leave the system in the form of, um, of gases. So that's the main motivation for that. Uh, we also tried other additives, and uh, such as some polymers, that they would also decompose under higher temperature. Uh, they didn't perform as good, um, but that's again an optimization problem we could look more into. But for now, we already find a cheap solution, so we kind of stop there. Understood. So you have to have the mindset of a, like an ALD or an MOCVD precursor designer yeah. uh, when you're working with this. I'm gonna hand it off to Matthias and I'll pass the baton to Ahmed. I just got a call from my son's daycare. I hope everything's okay, but I'm gonna step outside and handle that. Thank you, Tonya. Yeah. Uh, Clayton, this is an, an, an OSD experiment, uh, the mole experiment, which I think probably was really good. And uh, I think you had temperatures mentioned for the Clayton, this is a little bit different for that mole experiment. The Clayton, this was about 700, 800, and then the, the mole experiment was 170, 200. Celsius? Is it just because the heat transfer is different in these, in these systems? Or why could you do everything at a lower temperature by that sort of factor? I see. So yeah, this figure is a good illustration. So I think what Matisse is saying that, actually, I want to, I want to clarify that there are actually two temperature zones. We have a relatively mild temperature zone and also slower heating rate here and a higher heating rate of slash higher temperature zone with the flame. So for the, for the evaporation of the droplets, et cetera, we are all confined to the slower heating zone rather than the flame zone. Is that when, after, so essentially, but we, we do need to have the flame zone in the sense of we need to crystal, partially crystallize the material. And in the slow heating zone, that cannot be achieved. So we need to have two steps. But what we found uh, in our study was that actually it's also essential to have the preheating zone because we want to have a larger window to tailor the entire thermal process. And if we couldn't do it, we just spray things into the flame, very likely we are going to have explosions and we, have, we cannot have big particles formed, which is essential to battery materials. Thank you. Uh, your question? <clears throat> so, you talked about the P square rule for the droplet evaporation. 
Yeah. So like, does this still hold? Like, if, even if you have other materials inside the docket, I believe that rule is developed for the pure liquid droplet. But in your case, uh, you have you might have a less surface area because of the other materials. Then, in fact, I believe the if you have any materials like on the uh, interface, liquid vapor interface, uh, the evaporation the rate should be hindered. Yeah. So so. It's yes and no, so um, I can show you the, the slides, but the quick, quick answer to that is that it also depends on the concentration of the solvent that you have inside the, inside the droplet, right? So uh, since we, we didn't use a really uh, high uh, concentration, well, high is relative, and it, it, it's not that we are fitting it to the data, it's just how the data would show and I, I would say it's a pretty linear relationship there. It's actually not by presuming it's a d square law. It's that by looking at the data, we think d square law can be explained relatively well. But as you mentioned, right, as we have uh, the evaporation of the solvent of water leaving the system, meaning that the concentration of the rest is higher due to the evaporation of the solvent, we now uh, heating at a, a certain area where we start to deviate away from the d-square law. So what you said is, is true for those uh, scenarios. I have a question. I liked your slide about, um, in the beginning, about how this, I don't know, kind of why you're doing this. And I was wondering how, or have you looked at the economic analysis of when you can apply this and when you stop optimizing it and when the cost of building this new machine will be worth it? Yeah, that's a great question. That's ongoing work, so stay tuned for our next advancement. Yeah, so now we are also doing, a, it's called technical economic analysis and life cycle analysis, try to look at how this process can uh, um, make uh, economic sense. So from some rough estimations, we do see it's going to make a big impact in terms of having the significant reduction in the energy consumption during the synthesis process, as well as the simplified uh, process in terms of the capital equipment. So uh, the, the, the rough numbers we have is we, we can reduce uh, the carbon footprint by 30 to 50%, depending on how we operate it. But the detailed ones, we need to have a, a clear and a peer reviewed results to be released uh, to the public. Thank you for the question. Maybe I'll ask a short question while we, I'm thinking of another one, otherwise we can wrap up for already maybe a couple of minutes yeah. after time. <clears throat> so we know that fitting kinetic models is always data hungry. We need significant data sets to be able to convert the parameters. Do you have any insight of when you use the neural network to react to connect to neural network, you're able to save in the amount of data you needed? Yes. <laughs> well, <not CV. laughs> so, so, so I would say that the short answer is yes. We we demonstrated in a uncertainty quantification paper is that because of we we compared it with uh, the MLP the just the the simple neural network that everything's fully connected in that sense. So we do see that with the addition of the physics there, we essentially imp improve the inductive bias such that we can have a sh uh, more confined estimation and smaller uncertainty associated with the estimation. So that probably roughly answers your question, right? And uh, it's, if well, I, to uh, directly answer your question, that could be difficult to see. Maybe I have this data, I can train a model with other ma ma method I couldn't. But I think with uncertainty quantification aspects, that's a, a side uh, evidence on why, uh, how, how this uh, physics informed can do. And on the other hand is that there are also traditional methods of putting together things and especially using the expert knowledge and having a template and then we try to put in, uh, come up with the kinetic parameters by just running the optimization algorithm. That is a, a, a way to go as well. In that sense, I, I would say not only the data uh, is hungry, but also 
we could be biased because of the prior knowledge that we put into this. If your template is off, if your template is wrong, then even if you can fit the data well, you are missing it, right? Or you can just cannot fit it really well because you missed the, the templates. So that's why we wanted to be autonomous as autonomous as possible, but we also do not want a black box. Uh, so we want to have a good balance between the prior knowledge we have and uh, the data driven part. So for, for the example on the battery that Ben did was that in addition to the two fundamental laws, we also know something about there are three reactions in serial that, is ha uh, that has the evidence in the thermal XRD experiments. Then we can incorporate that additional information that would also, presumably, that would also give us inductive bias that can help us uh, require less data for that. So in that case, we only had five experiments and they can predict really, really, really well. To reinforce it, to reinforce, basically to agree with Celine and reinforce, because my group also did a very similar approach to epidemiology some time back. And uh, in this case, the, the physical law is not a regularizer, unlike pins. Uh, in, uh, in our friend and in that is pins. The physical law is like a suggestion, right? It is added as a regularizer. It's supposed to, to remove uh, uh, components of the data that are physically unfeasible because they come from noise or whatever. But in this case, the way SCB is doing it, Actually, the physical law is a hard constraint. Basically, the neural network is forced to obey the differential equations. They cannot get, cannot do without, right? So that is the reason why it is not super data hungry. It is designed to, to basically to have a gap, to have a physical law as a guardian. Yeah, actually, just to connect between the two, my question was the second part of what uh, Celiana said, comparing the classical method of fitting Kennedy uh, algorithms with the Reaction based neural network. This, these are the two that I start to compare the two. Okay, any other questions? All right, so let's uh, thank you again.